Hi guys, Clint Anderson here. Welcome back to our Titan training series. Uh, we've got a lot of great response from you guys on YouTube that you're enjoying it. So we're gonna keep producing for you the diary of me training Titan through his performance horse career and hopefully beyond that as well. Uh, I've got big plans for this horse outside of the show pen and we'll just see how far his career will actually go. So today is June 30th, okay, uh, 2016. So he's had exactly 12 months, well 11 months, uh, actually 13 months of training. We started him June 1st of last year, so he's basically had 13 months of training. Um, he's coming along really well, very happy with the horse. Uh, he's by far the best, most, most talented, naturally talented horse I've had to train. Um, great minded, and my job is just to kind of bring him along, you know. The biggest thing that I find that I'm, I struggle with, when I say struggle, I have to be aware of it. Let's just say that, it's constantly there. He feels so good and he's so naturally talented, uh, I have to find myself constantly pulling back and not pushing him to what I feel like he's capable of doing. Because of his age, he's, you know, he's had six months less riding than the other fertility horses. Uh, I wanna make sure I develop him uh, the way he needs to be developed. You know, it really takes two years to train a reigning horse from start to finish and do a really good job. Take your time, riding them five days a week, sometimes six, and, and just kind of keeping them in the program. So uh, even though it's his fertility year, if he's ready to show, I'll for, so, for sure show him. If I don't think he's ready to show, I won't show him. I want to keep this horse sound and happy and, and liking his job for many years to come, you know, through his four, five, six year old, seven year old year and have a long, prosperous career. And you can do that under two circumstances. One, the horse stays physically sound. You're not riding them so much that, that you're hurting them or crippling them. And two, they enjoy their job and they like what they're doing. You know, people are the same way. If you do the same boring job every boring day, um, you know, you, you hate kind of waking up and doing it, okay? So I'm riding him now most of the time in a one-handed bridle, like a shank bit. I ride him typically on a Monday and maybe even a Tuesday in some sort of a snaffle bit, twisted wire snaffle, something like that. Even when I put my horses in a, in a bridle, a shank bit, uh, and a, a shank bit means that it works more of vertical flexion, you know, more of vertical pressure rather than lateral. Snaffle bits are meant for bending and softening and suppling, which I love all that stuff. Doesn't mean you can't do it in a shank bit, but you can't get all the little, you know, little stiff spots out of them, at least I can't. So on Monday and Tuesday of every week, I always come back and work on softening the body parts more in, in, in depth with a snaffle bit. I find, and then when I put them back in a shank bridle again, a one-handed bit, they just feel so much better. But if I leave my horse in a one-handed bit for two weeks straight, I actually think they feel worse. But by the end of the two weeks, they're kind of pulling on me and leaning on me. And that's where typical trainers go for a bigger bit. Well, let's get a bigger bit. Let's get something more severe. I actually do the opposite. When they start feeling stiff and heavy on me, I go back to foundation. I go back to the five body parts. I go back to getting them soft and supple. Because when you go to a bigger bit, bigger bit, bigger bit, pretty soon there's not a bit big enough that you can intimidate them with to listen to that. You know, they, you know, you, pretty soon you're riding around with, you know, a bit with shanks so damn long, you need wheels on the bottom of the shanks to keep it off the ground. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I go the opposite. And you'll notice this bit that I'm riding him in, it's just a little, um, it has a real short little shank on it. I don't like bits with big long shanks on them. I'm not saying I won't ride one in a longer shank, uh, that's for sure, but I typically don't like them. I like a bit with a shorter shank, it has less leverage, uh, and I like a real loose chin strap, okay? Lo real loose uh, chain, so that when I pick up on the reins, there's a lot of signal before the chain interferes with their jaw, okay? Where if the chain's real tight, th they don't have a chance to get off that bridle. There's no pre-signal there, okay? So I like a real loose chain uh, you know, and again, personal preference. Some trainers want that chain a lot tighter so it engages quicker. I find the horses get a little fractious when it's too tight and get a little worried about it where I don't want my horse scared of the bit or intimidated of it. I want him giving, don't get me wrong. He better damn well respect it, but I don't want him scared of it or intimidated of it, okay?
so today um, I'm going to work on some different things with him. Uh, uh, every day I try to warm my horse up different. I've stressed that before in other parts of the series. Uh, so a different warm up every day. The first 10 minutes is just me and him getting on the same page. I'm checking for soundness. I'm checking for stiffness. I'm checking for trainability. You know, are you grumpy? Are you good? Are you bad? Are you listening? You know, it's our little first little check-in type of uh, uh, an exercise. But I try to do each day's warm up a little bit different so it's not the same boring thing. I find that when horses know what you're gonna do, when you become so predictable that you do the same thing every single day in order, uh, the really smart, intelligent horses, they get three steps ahead of you. They're like, okay, I'm, Clinton's gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, he's gonna do this, and this is how I'm gonna get out of it. Where if you keep moving the ball around the court, he has no idea what we're gonna do every day. And when a horse doesn't, I want my horse to know how to accomplish the goal, but I don't want him so predictable that, I, that I'm so easy to read because the smart ones will get ahead of you. Now the ones that are dumb as a bag of rocks, no, they'll never get ahead of you. They're too friggin' dumb and stupid to get ahead of you. But the intelligent horses absolutely will. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll move the program around enough that there's enough variety in their day-to-day -day training that their horse is like, oh, that's kind of new, even though they might have done it three days ago. It's kind of new, that's kind of new, oh, that's different. And it kind of keeps them engaged, okay? So when I get on him now, I'm not saying that I won't flex him with a shank bit. You for sure can work on your lateral flexion. But I typically do a little more flexing with the snaffle bit on, on a Monday and a Tuesday, okay? From here, uh, what I'll typically do is just kind of get on him. And I kind of just get on him and, and I'll bridge my range just iniz initially. And I'm still working on a little bit of my bending here, but I, I'm kind of doing it more off that neck rein, okay? And again, just walking him around, making sure when I draw that rein across his neck, I want him to look in and, 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 and circle that way. Now obviously, when you're suppling, you're not worried about how bent they are. In fact, when I say worried about it, you want them bent. When you're su suppling a horse's five body parts, bend is your friend. When you're guiding your horse or steering him or showing him, bend is not your friend. Okay, too much bend and a horse one-handed in a bridle will get you in a lot of trouble during a lead change. It, it'll screw you up all kinds of ways. But that's when you're guiding and steering. But when you're in a, in a suppling mode, no, it's the opposite. The more you bend a horse, the softer they get. The straighter you keep them, the stiffer and pushier they get. A lot of people say, well, Clint, how do I get my horse to neck rein? And it's almost like they're asking you, like, you just do this one thing and the horse suddenly, you know, automatically starts neck reining. Neck reining is a process over months and months that you build to get the horse to neck rein really well. Now, that's the key word. Now, I can teach a horse to neck rein in two weeks if you want it to be ugly. You know, you get the reins, drag it across the horse's neck, he goes left. Drag it across the horse's right, he goes right, you know. You know, you can get any horse to neck rein, but getting them to look in when they feel that rein across their neck to actually look the opposite direction and go that way is hard. Most horses can neck rein, especially if you don't care if their head tips up to the side and the reins get drug across the horse's neck. Like on the old westerns, yeah, and they'd grab the reins and yank them across the horse's neck and the horse goes that way. That's not neck reining to me, that's, that's, that's bad horsemanship. To get a horse to where you lay that rein and they look away and they go that way, look and go, that takes time. So I've been riding, you know, Titan now for 13 months, and it's 13 months theoretically of practice to get to where you saw him today. Well, when I lay that neck rein, he looks that way, goes that way. When I lay that neck rein, he looks that way and goes that way. And he still needs another year of it till I feel like he's really, really good to where I can just hold the reins between my fingers and, and you know, theoretically just go anywhere I want. He'll always go that way and look that way. So it's a long process. Now, again, that's to do it really well with a lot of finesse and correctness. If you want to be a little little cowboy about it, well, how it takes a hell of a lot less time, but you're not going to get any, you're not going to mark anything in a show pen. Any, any sport that you need to ride your horse one-handed, it can't look ugly with the horse's head up and mouth open and gapping on the bit because you're yanking the reins across his neck. So I just kind of walk him around here, lay that rein. I'm still working on a lot of foundation work with him. Foundation, foundation, foundation. You know, he's kind of at a point now where, where things kind of get a little boring to some degree, is meaning that I'm not necessarily working on a hell of a lot of new stuff every single week, but it's just perfecting the stuff that he kind of already knows. It's building his confidence. So when I lay that rein, the first thing he does is bring that nose to the inside. Okay, so I'm real, real anal about that, of just making sure when they feel that rein, 
Now watch, if I draw it further to my hip, he'll move his shoulders just off the neck around. I'm not touching him with my right leg at all. Now I'm gonna put my inside leg on and go back to the circle. So he knows when he feels that rain across his neck more, that means move his shoulders. So I'm not worried about him being overbent. What I'm worried about is will he soften when I lay that outside rain, like he's going straight now. When I lay that outside rain, the first thing it turns in is his nose. Now right there he kind of dove in a little bit with his shoulder, so I, used, I rolled that inside spur on his belly to kind of push that shoulder out. If I draw to my hip, again, he'll move that shoulder. I'm not working on a turnaround there, I'm just making sure that if I lay that rain on his neck some more, he'll turn. Remember to keep watching, mate, as we keep Titan and the method moving forward.